So, just some conclusions. Well, first thing is, to answer your question, nice tee up, there are no direct regulatory requirements that say you've got to get this much data, right? That's the good news. The bad news is if you ever have an incident, somebody's going to come look over your shoulder and ask the question, right? What that means is you actually got to do some work and write some things down to say, we're making a decision that we're going to get this much data, and here's how we're rationalizing that decision, right? So you, you have to do some engineering. But there are some inferred standards when you get to the control room management rule within the FEMSA regulations around adequate information and alarming. There's some things that are kind of inferred about the quality and availability of data. There are, certain, there are certainly things that are directly inferred, although not specified, in the 1130 API 1130, which is incorporated into the regulations, it doesn't actually say you've got to get this much data, but it says you need to do an analysis of how much data is necessary to identify leaks in your operation. So the bottom line in all of this is what we really got to do to answer this question is you, first you have to understand what are the operating considerations, what are the risks associated with my operations, and then what data do I need to capture and how do I need to manage that data to deal with those risks? So hopefully what I've done in this presentation is give you a framework where you can kind of deliberately walk through a process and ask and answer those questions. So that's what I have for prepared remarks. Anybody have any questions? I'd be glad to take a few questions before we wrap it up. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think it's probably not that directly connected. You know, I think it's going to be, that question's going to come up on the second or third round. You know, the first thing they're going to be looking at is, what was the situation in the control room? What was the situation in the field? Who talked to who? You know, what things were in the way? all that kind of stuff, and then some reasonable expectations. But once they dig deep enough, they're going to come up to this. Now, what is the chance you're going to get fined or have some kind of action taken? I think it's probably pretty slight, so long as you've done an appropriate level of due diligence and it's tied back to what the regulatory framework is, right? So. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Can no, no, no. You know, the, the, the more you study these regulations, what you realize is they're almost all proscriptive, not proscriptive, meaning there's very few things that they say you've got to do exactly this. Most all of it is you need to follow these guidelines, which means it's incumbent upon the operator to write their own internal policy and procedure around this. All right, so... Yeah, short answer is no. Yes, sir. Yesterday you talked about leak detection system and control room management. Are there any additional requirements on what an detector requires from the data once collected in the API? I think I understand the question you're asking. I'll try and restate it. Uh, so what he was asking is, in the, in the area of leak detection and control room management, which are two different things that are in the Pipeline Safety Act, in, in the, you know, the 49 CFR 192-195, are there any direct requirements around how much data or how you analyze that data to get a control room? The short answer is none that I'm aware of, right? However, I do think that when you look at the leak detection rules and what you're, what's needed in order that you respond, you identify a leak, and when you look at the control room management rules and what's needed to operate the pipeline safe, safely, you can infer that what the expectation of the regulators is, is, is there, if there's a leak, there's going to be an alarm, and if there's a leak alarm to the control room, the control room is going to be equipped to take effective corrective action or responsive action, 
right? But again, nothing specific. An example of NASIS would be, is there any requirement to, for example, track a batch? If there are multiple uh, products that you're pipeline, does the API talk about tracking each individual batch so you know where it is along the pipeline all the time? Not in any of the stuff that I'm aware of from a leak detection or control management standpoint. I'm sure there are other guidelines in the API about batch tracking that, I'm, that are outside of my expertise, right? But if you're asking, here's the thing. I don't think if you go through any of the regulations, you're going to find direct requirements. you got to do this. They don't do that. So why would the regulators not do that? Why wouldn't they just say, I want you to do this? Yeah, so that would be the higher road answer, right? I have, my notion is that the regulators are really here to help the industry, and what they're doing is they're laying standards that all have to play by so that I can't operate more cheaply by being more risky, right? So they're, but they don't want to tell you how to run their, your business because they don't know. You know how to run your business. We're just going to say, this is the standard, but you decide how to best run your business to this standard. It's one answer. The other answer is, if they do prescribe and there's a problem, whose fault is it? It's their fault. Right. Do they want it to be their fault? No. No. Right? So that, that's the other side of it. That's the more uh, skeptical kind of answer. Well, they want to be able to tell us we were wrong. <laughs> so, yes, sir. There's no, there are no standards for gas leak detection at present. There are no regulatory requirements for gas leak detection. FEMSA has published notices of proposed rulemaking about gas leak detection. The problem is they, they actually did a study on this uh, uh, several years ago, and when they put out their report, what they said is there's no technology that's commercially viable and appropriately accurate for doing gas leak detection. Okay, so I'm going to offer my opinion. I think what will probably happen is they're going to require gas rupture protection before they require leak protection, or get rupture detection before they require leak detection on the natural gas side. And can you tell us why? Well, because if you look at the major incidents that we've had in the last five years, they've all been related to natural gas ruptures. Yes. Right? So, which is why they've got all kinds of new regulations about. It's a lot of the natural gas pipelines, particularly in the LDCs, were built prior to 1960. So, all that stuff is old, right? And much of it is unpiggable, meaning they can't get a smart pig in there and, and find out exactly how is it welded. So, they're inferring. And what, what they're, where the regulators are going is nope you're going to have to direct assess all your pipe or you're going to have to replace it. And they're putting timelines on that. So that's where the emphasis is. And to me, the natural next place is when you do get a rupture, I expect you to turn it off quickly. And they're already kind of going there with the requirements for additional mainline valves <coughs> and for those mainline valves to be instrumented and telemetered. Well, in the, in, the, in the liquids world, these are systems that run side by side with the SCADA system and run in real time. So when we integrate those, we actually, when we get an alarm, we actually flag that alarm into the controller's HMI and we give them the reported location and size of the leak and a severity because of where it's at and the size of it. So, which, if you want to hear my conversation about alarm management, that's later today. So. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation. I hope this was valuable and, and helpful.